Wow. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, you sent this out to Burkina Faso six months ago. And we have certainly found things are a little different there. This is what they call PlayStation 3 there. <laughs> they have a simpler way of life. And people, the first thing they do when they see us back here in the States is, is Mike, how is it? I mean, you're there. And, and, and you know, a lot of you heard the stories, you know, uh, Amy and, and Delaney got very sick uh, for three weeks, you know, when we first arrived. I mean, sick. And uh, people are like, wow, must be hard. So, so really, really, Mike, how is it? Wow! Wow, 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 wow! It is so much better, so much bigger, so much more wonderful than we could have ever dreamed by simply following what God had for us. It was the most incredible thing. I figured we'd first get there and we'd spend the first six months, you know, we had a six month stay and, and uh, first six months just getting acclimated and, and, you know, just hanging out and kind of seeing what's going on. Wow, did God have other plans? Uh, we got a couple slides just to show you some things that are going on there. Maybe. There we go. This is Aruna. Aruna came to us three days old, showed up at our gate at the orphanage. Mother was not mentally well. Never had a bite of food. Three days old. Never had anything to drink. No water. No milk, no nothing. You could sit there and pinch his skin and it would just stay in the exact position that you pinched it from dehydration. Amy took this baby and started to feed it. And, and the baby would not, would not eat because it was in failure to thrive. This poor baby, very near death, is now three months old, getting chunky, Smiling. We need to understand. We need to understand. This is you guys saved this baby's life. If someone were to fall down right in front of me, and someone were to come here and resuscitate, resuscitate that person, probably Mike Hall, but would resuscitate that person, you would go, what a hero. That person saved that. You guys saved Aruna. You told us, hey, go out there. Take care of him. Latif. Latif sitting at an orphanage. Another orphanage. We hear about him. He's HIV positive. They're scared of him at the orphanage. He sits in the corner. He doesn't interact with the kids. He's three years old. Cannot walk. Cannot do anything. God somehow alerts us to it. We go to that orphanage. We sit there and we take pictures because we know one thing about Americans is they will adopt a kid like that. Europeans, nothing against Europeans, sorry. But the European agencies, they don't like, they're scared. So we go and take pictures. The next day we get a phone call. Hey, you came and took pictures of this kid. Would you like him? <sighs> yeah. We took him. We have a clinic on our grounds. We were able to educate our tanties, the girls who, the ladies who take care of the babies, the aunties, the, we call them tanties. And now, this kid, just in a matter of months, is walking, is interacting with kids, is laughing. This kid has a hope. This kid has a future. Because of what you guys are doing. We have all sorts of kids. This is Ferdy. And if everyone promises not to say anything, okay? Good? Ferdy's getting adopted. He doesn't know it yet. Ferdy... I promise not to cry. <laughs> Ferdy's going to Detroit. Um, he is considered special needs because he's over 10 years old. Uh, he's moving to Detroit. Uh, these kids are just awesome kids. We have a Bible study that we do with all the orphans. And we do this on Tuesday nights. Every Tuesday night, it is led by orphans. It is taught by orphans. 
the music is led by orphans. It is, it is uh, part of the way that we are bringing Christ to all those. Let me tell you, there's pastors and there's doctors that live in this orphanage. They're just not there yet. There's missionaries in this orphanage that just aren't there yet. But they're growing. They're being discipled. And they will be the next pastors. We have a primary school. The primary school, we just dove right in. So we have all these kids, Muslim, animist, all these kids that are coming and getting the gospel, getting a Christian education every single day. Why? Because you guys said we're going to support people in Africa. We're going to sponsor kids. We're going to be there for those kids. We have a secondary school for the 7th and 8th graders. And, and again, these families want their kids educated. They're dying to have their kids educated. So an animist family, a Muslim family, is going to send their kids to a Christian school so that they can. And these kids are bringing the gospel into their villages and spreading the word of hope. Uh, we have a clinic. I mentioned the clinic we have. And these are our two nurses in the clinic. There's something special about these nurses. The one on the right there, she was our very first orphan at this orphanage 12 years ago. The other one was an orphan in our orphanage. Her brother is also in our orphanage. And we are praying that he becomes a doctor. Um, these girls go out and do medical outreaches. They go to villages and they give the desperate, desperate need for care, for medical care. People are dying every day just because they don't know. Just because they don't know. It's just one little pill that they could take that would get rid of the parasites that's starving their body of the nutrients that they need to live to survive. So we go out. Um... Malnutrition is number one. These kids, mothers think they're healthy. Baby's got a big belly. I must be doing a good job. Their arms and their legs are withering. And their stomachs are getting bigger. The parasites are swelling. These people are dying and they don't know it. There's so many deaths that happen in Africa and people just, it's part of being African. So these kids were able to go out into these villages. And now we have malnutrition programs in their villages. We see it. We go there. We teach the mothers what to look for, how to do it. We give them education. We give them food. Never walked in his life. We do Bible clubs. This is, we go out to a little village. We do it in a few villages, but this is Dore, which is really close to, to my heart. And uh, these kids come out, some in their little Muslim outfits, some in their, but they all wear their Sunday best when they come out. That is their Sunday best. And, and they have a lesson. We give them a Bible lesson. We do a little art project, and they get boom, boom. Everyone remember what boom, boom is? They get a little piece of candy, and they're just all excited. We had 104 kids last time I was there. 104 kids in this tiny little village come out to this thing and get the gospel. We're digging wells. You know, last time I was up on this stage six months ago, I said God was calling us to dig some wells. Well, God got me out there and God got me dirty and God got me sweaty and God got me bitten by bugs and, and digging wells and I was never so happy in my life. Uh, a group called Friends in Action is out there they're trying to get me on full-time. I'm sorry. I told them I got a full-time gig, but man, I'll help you out anytime I can. Um, there's me digging, and that's actually not a pose. I was actually working. Really. So we dug two wells in Kimini. This is an evangelism. We do evangelisms. These people, you heard, the fields are white. The fields are ready. These evangelisms, 700 people will come out. Hundreds will be saved. Hundreds will be saved by being there. 
by showing up, by going out, just spreading the word. They are so hungry for the gospel. They just need to know. You guys are making a difference. You're going out. You're doing it. You're sending people. Sending me. Sending Amy. Sending Delaney. Sending Evan. Sending people out to spread God's love. This is your work. Not ours. Uh, Bible club. We do Bible club at the school and the kids can come out and just do an art project and, and, and learn about God and they'll have a little, little story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I won't get into the details, but they just had fun with fire that day. Um, just, just a wonderful group. And these are led again. That's one of our orphans, the older boy there, that helps lead it. That's Kendra. She's also here from South Florida. She came out and visited us with us for three months from Oasis Church, our sister church out west. She heard me speak one time. She says, I want to come out. And she led this where kids would come out every single week. There's me talking with my translator and my pastor. Um, that's me and Pastor Valentine. And uh, I preach there once a month. He wanted me twice a month, but like I said, God's using us for so many great things. We're just, we're just going and, and uh, just seeing where God leads us. So the good thing is I only have to come up with half a sermon because it has to be translated. Bad thing is the services are three and a half hours long. So sponsorship program. Margaret Geraldo's sponsored child. This child is sponsored out of this church. This child gets food, gets gifts, gets the love of Christ from this church. But it's not just this kid. These are just some of the kids that are sponsored out of this group, out of people sitting in this room right now. These are the people that care for them. These are the people that are there for them, give them food, that give them hope every month. You guys are making the difference. And I think that is it. That is it. So... God is just doing some amazing things. So when I thought I could be there and that I thought that I could just kind of relax and get used to what's going on and see what's going on, God was already so busy at work, I jumped on this, this, this train that God had going over there, and it's going fast. It broke our heart, and, and, and I love you all. I love you all. Some more than others. Bill, not so much. But... It was hard to leave there. It was hard to leave those kids. I had 25 people on my porch the day I was leaving just to say goodbye. I had kids sitting on my porch at 7 a.m. I wasn't leaving till 11 o'clock that morning. I had kids on my porch 7 a.m. to make sure when I woke up and I got out that they wouldn't miss me. You guys are making a difference. You guys are changing this world. And you know what? There's people in here that God wants out there. Maybe not in Africa. Maybe not in South America, but it could be. But you're glued to this seat. You're not seeing it. You're not hearing God's call. God is calling us all to be missionaries. We're going to speak in uh, Luke 19, verses 1 through 5, but don't, don't quite turn there yet. One thing that I have learned in Africa, well, really, one thing I've learned through this whole process of, of getting to Africa and being uh, on my way to Africa and, and, and getting there and doing it, is the blatant way, the in-your-face way that Satan has this ability to take your blessing that God has given you and turn it into your curse. Turn it into something that is evil, that is wrong. Only Satan would have that ability. 
You know, let's turn to Genesis. I have my Bible. No, I got my Bible. Genesis. Let's, I mean, he starts it out. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like ourselves. Listen closely. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. God gave you this earth. God gave you this world to you, for you to reign over, for you to control. Everything. That's a lot of stuff. And he didn't just give you the trees. He didn't just make a tree and say, okay, Tim, you're in charge of that tree. Okay? Mike, you're in charge of that thing there, the thing that scurries along the ground. No, he didn't do that. He gave you the whole earth. He created over 100,000 species of just the trees. Over a million species of animals and insects and bugs and things that scurry. And let me tell you something. We got a lot of those in Africa. Let me go a little further, be a little more precise. We get a lot of those in our home. So that can be interesting. And as my wife can tell you, sometimes in the middle of church, and, and at a church there is a little bit different. This is our seat at church. We can't sit there right in front and we get to stare at everyone because we're missionaries. So even when I'm not preaching, I'm sitting right here, which is okay until your wife reaches into her purse and a gecko jumps out and climbs right into her dress. True story. Just about had a very exciting service that day. So we have all these things. There's big ones, there's little ones, there's in-between ones. Some that smell, some that bite. Kind of like children if you look at it that way. But God gave us domain over all of it. God gave us control over all of it. God gave us this as a gift, as a responsibility. But this gift, this responsibility ends up controlling us. Ends up controlling us to the point where it's dictating what you're doing all day long. The problems you have, the things that, this, you know, that, that happen throughout the day, it's controlling what your day is. You're not controlling the world. The world is controlling you. Why? God's looking like, I gave you this. Why are you letting this happen? The world finds a way to form the way we think, blocks your view of God. If these problems that the world presents, the grind, the every day is blocking your view, they're only blocking your view of God. And it's your decision if you wanted to let it to continue to block your view. Because if you can't see God, you cannot worship God. If you allow these things to be in your way, if you think you're worshiping God, you're not. You need to rise above the career that you work, 70 hours a week, so that you and your wife can survive. Really. You need that job to survive. Come out to Africa. We'll show you exactly what you need to survive. They will show you. They will minister to you and show you exactly what you need to survive. There's a story in the Bible of a man who, who, who kind of figured this out. Wasn't a big man. Wasn't a popular guy. Wasn't even a Christian at the time. But he got it. Zacchaeus. Anyone know Zacchaeus? 
Now, right now, I can tell who grew up in the, in the, in the Sunday school system. You know why? You know how? I look around, and as soon as I say the name Zacchaeus, some people are like, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. I love that song. I still sing it. Uh, verses 1 and 2. You know what? I might as well turn to it, too. Just join you all in this sermon of ours. Luke 19. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He's a tax collector. This is a man who was not like. This is a man, he was Jewish, but he worked for the Roman government. He was what they considered a traitor. The Jews considered him a traitor of his own, of his own kind. He was not liked. They collected the taxes, and in, in, in most times, they over-collected the taxes. They cheated their own people out of, out of their right. They were not liked at all. Not someone that would sit there and think, well, you know what? God might be calling me. God might have something to say to me. I, I, I might be... I might need to be ready. No. This is someone who, who, who has heard about Christ, but certainly doesn't know who he is. This guy had everything. This guy was living the dream. I mean, he had a good job. He had a lot of money. You know, he had servants. He had the best of the food. You know, he probably had a nice little nest egg set aside. Probably had a cabin in the mountains, probably had, you know, a vintage car in his, in his carport. And, and he, he, he had everything, his goals. He was right on track of what he had planned. God? No, 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 not what God had planned, what he had planned. Because he wasn't looking for what God was trying to tell him. The world had him convinced of what he needed, what he wanted. The world dictated to him what his future was. We've all heard of the cart pushing the donkey. Well, maybe that's a little too African. Maybe, you know, nowadays it's like, have you heard of the global positioning system in your smartphone uh, telling, asking you, well, how do we get there? No, it's backwards. It's backwards. The world is trying to tell him where he needs to be, where he needs to get to. Where are you taking your direction from? Think about the plans you have for the future. Is it from God? Are you sitting there thinking, well, you know what? I'm not someone God could use. But I got my cabin in the mountains. I've got my car in the garage. I've got my future all planned out. The world that you were given domain over. It's hard because the world just seems so big sometimes. It's hard to resist it. You know, a lot of times when we're feeling that way, it's not because the world is big. I can tell you right now, it's not because the world's so big. It's because you're making God so small. We serve a big God. I mean, he formed this earth just with his fingertips because he didn't need his whole hand. He breathed the stars out of his mouth, which are thousands of times larger than this earth. And you're making this world that he formed like this, bigger than him. You serve the biggest God. You serve the one true God. You serve 
the creator of everything. Don't ever make him any smaller. Verse 3. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. Hmm. Do you feel too short sometimes? Do you feel like you don't have a clear view of God? You know, Zacchaeus has heard of Jesus. He knew about Jesus. He heard the stories about Jesus. So he, he wanted to see Jesus. Everyone in this room has heard of this guy that walked this earth a couple thousand years ago named Jesus Christ. But there's so many in this room that are sitting down and not getting a clear view of who Jesus is, of who God is, of what God has to say. We need to get up. Zacchaeus was now prepared to see Jesus. But you see, Zacchaeus had this problem. From the position he was standing, and from his perspective, he could not get a clear view of Jesus. Wherever he looked, he couldn't see him. He knew one thing. He wanted to have a clear view of God. How's your view of God? Do you have a clear perspective? Or has the world placed all these problems in front of you? Placed this these people in front of you that, that may be blocking your view. Maybe this lifestyle, maybe this television, maybe this computer is blocking your view. Maybe this lifestyle that you had, that once you became a Christian, and once you found God, you haven't been able to shake, you haven't been able to move from it, you haven't been able to change your perspective. We become Christians. We accept Christ. We understand Christ. We've heard of Christ. We know what he did. We know the stories. And we sit there, and we never change our view. So if Zacchaeus never changed his view, God would keep on walking. Zacchaeus had no idea what, he had, what God had planned for him. He had to change his perspective. He had to change what he was looking at. He had to change Everything about his perspective to see God. And more importantly, to hear what God had to say. Are you listening to what God is saying to you today? Has the world dictated to you what to look at, what to see? in what to hear? Or are you in control of what you're doing? Zacchaeus, like I said, had no idea what, he had, what God had planned for him. So if you have this plan of your future, of what you're doing, of your retirement, of your, of your, of your week, of your day, of your afternoon, I'm sorry, I'm making you planners like really uncomfortable right now because I know there's some people here that are just okay that I'm doing this 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 I'm going to retire when I'm this old I'm going to do this and I'm going to move here and I'm going to do this I got it all figured out Woo! you didn't just get blocked by people you turned around and walked away you are really missing how are you supposed to know what God has planned for you how do you know what God's going to say to you when he looks over at you, looks you straight in the eye, straight in the eye and says, you know what, I'm hanging out with you tonight. If you got this plan, I'm sorry, God. I know you want to hang, but I got this appointment at 2 o'clock. I got to run. And this pastor went a little long. Dude, I got to go. You've got to be ready. You've got to be willing. You've got to desire to listen to God. You've got a desire to see God. You've got a desire to rise above 
the distraction. And you can't just walk to get there. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting too excited here. Um, verse 4. So Zacchaeus ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road. For Jesus was going to pass that way. Do you notice what he said? He didn't, he didn't walk. He didn't casually look around. He didn't say, oh, well, you know what? There's a sycamore tree right here. Maybe I'll climb that. Maybe I'll get a better view. No, he ran. He ran. Because he wanted to get in line with what God was already doing. He saw God's path. He knew who he was. He knew what he had to say. He wanted to run and get in line so that he could see him too. That he can be part of what's going on. How many of us are willing to run away from our position in life right now? How many of you are willing to run away from your job right now? Well, some of you might be like, oh yeah, I could do that like right now. No, but really, to leave comfort, to leave what you think, what the world has told you is where you're supposed to be right now. Because there's a lot of people sitting here today that are sitting where they are in life sitting in their position, and they are taking a perspective that the world told them, hey, this is where you need to be. You're on your way. You're going to have a nice little pension. You're going to have a nice little retirement. You know, you, you're, you're going to have a nice little home. You, have a, you, know, you might even get a little, nice little motorcycle when you retire. I'm, I'm hoping for that one, but... Unfortunately, my retirement plan all happens in heaven. God has a plan for you. Don't let him walk by. I might need my glasses just to see. How many of us are refusing to take a new position in life? Do you understand what Zacchaeus understood? You don't want to let Christ walk by without seeing him. Because what he's bringing with him is your blessing, is your life, is who you're meant to be. Let me tell you something. The moment I got to Africa, and I stepped on African soil again, I was home. My wife, my daughter, we stepped on African soil. We're home. This is who we were made to be. This is it. We should have been here. We should have been born African. We were born African. It just took us a little while to get there. God had this plan from when I was born. The day I was born, the day I was adopted, I was an orphan for four days. Toughest four days of my life, let me tell you. God had this plan for me to be in Africa to help him with this orphanage. That I could be in line with what he was already doing. I just had to get and rise above to find and run towards my sycamore tree. I had to climb it so I could be above distraction. And if you think sitting in here every single week for an hour a day does it? I'm sorry. You're sitting in here. There's just as many people out here and there's just as many distractions in here as there is out there. So if you're looking and you have a problem with something that's being sung up here or, or, or the, the person that's sitting next to you or, or, I mean, some crazy stuff. Guys, you're looking at the crowd in front of you. You're not looking at God. You don't have a clear view. If you're sitting there and telling, oh man, did you see that guy at church today? I'm sorry, no. I saw God. I, I must have missed it. What, the, the, the music? There's there something wrong with the music? I didn't hear it. I heard angels singing. Where's your perspective? What are you looking at? We need to concentrate and look at God. Not at the person in front of me. Not at the person next to me. Not at the pastor. It's hard to do sometimes. 
Because the world's telling you, no, 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 no. Look at those people next to you. No, I'm not. I'm going to watch God. If you want to, by all means, you just go ahead and look. I got something else I need to do. Had to rise above it all. For me, here, it was my sycamore tree was going up to the rock. Dealing with these teens. I listened to God. I was able to hear God. And God says, you know, Mike, I want you to climb up the sycamore tree. I want you to go up in the rock. Because I want to prepare you for Africa. I want to prepare you to deal with kids. I want to prepare you by having no air conditioning for a year and, and having it 110 degrees up in the rock. For some miraculous reason, the moment I go to Africa, the air conditioning started working upstairs. Not a surprise to me. Not a surprise to me. I come back. I spoke in the rock last Wednesday. Guess what? Air conditioning was broken. First time. So, you know, God has a way. He has a plan. People fill this church. The pastor is just a man. But here's the cool thing about the church that you guys go to. Your pastor knows the way to the sycamore tree. And he is excellent at giving directions. He can show you the GPS. And he can say, dude, GPS is right here. You're supposed to be going left. And you just made a hard bank towards the right. Are you listening? Because God uses people to speak into your life. We need to lose our distractions. We need to work towards it. It was his diligence of climbing a tree, of seeing a tree and going to it, in running to it, in climbing it, in working for it, that he was able to see Christ, and more importantly, he was able to hear Christ. He was able to listen over all the crowd. He got above the noise. He got above the people. He got above... He left his job down there on the ground. He left his bills down there on the ground. He left his mother and well, maybe that's too, too personal, but he left everything that distracted him on the ground. He climbed that sycamore tree, looked over, saw God, and God saw that this man did what he could to separate himself from the distractions. And God blessed that. God looked at him and said, dude, you, right there. Tonight, we got plans. You didn't know about it, but I'm staying at your house. We're going to eat together. Is God trying to tell you that? Are you sitting on that chair and you've been wondering, oh, you know what, I would love to do this. I would love to go into missions. I would love to, but, you know, I got this job. I got this, you know, I got these, I've got all these things that I have to do to survive. You know what? God is in control. God is bigger than not just your world. God is bigger than the world. In your world that seems so big, you know, he looks down, and he's, he looks down at me all the time and chuckles, obviously. But he's looking down going, you don't get it. You don't get it. You're looking down. Look up. I've got a place for you. I've got a job for you. I've got some cool stuff for you to do. Just, just do it. Climb your sycamore tree. Does the world convince you that you're not good enough? This is a guy, Zacchaeus, 
was hated, was a tax collector, was not even a Christian, but God had a plan for him. Some of you may be sitting there and you go, I've had this sin in my life. You know, I'm not exactly there yet. Maybe when I become one of these super Christians, that I'll be able to do that. I'll be able to get into missions. I'll be able to... I'm sorry, but I have a, an awful confession to make. I'm not a perfect man. I know some of you might have, find that hard to believe. I'm not a super Christian. But I am completely, 100% submitted to Christ. Whatever he wants for me to do, I'm not a committed Christian. I used to be a committed Christian. I used to do everything I possibly could for God. But I wasn't submitted because I never listened to what he wanted me to do. I was thinking locally, he was thinking globally. I might have been thinking globally and he was thinking locally at one time. You don't know. The point of the matter is, is that you need to not be distracted. You need to rise above it. What is your life? Do you have a big career plan? Do you have a retirement plan? Relaxation? Doing nothing for the rest of your life after you reach 63? <laughs> I don't think that plan's from God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. God has this great retirement plan, but it, like I said, it all happens in heaven. Matthew 28. 19 and 20. He's called us all to missions. Therefore, go, go, get up, go, run, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, that I am always with you, always, even to the end of the age. What happened up there today is biblical. What happened up there today needs to happen all around the world. And it is not the responsibility of someone else. It is our responsibility. God just commissioned you to this task. If you think missions is for someone else, you're wrong. Missions is for you. And you know it. God has made you for it. God has threaded it into you, but you're stuck on this seat. You're glued. He has it all over the world. Mark, chapter 16, verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Go. He's not saying, okay, sit where you're at. Find someone right around you. He's saying to go. Now he also says, you know, it could be in Jerusalem, it could be in Samaria, it could be to the outer ends of the earth. Your mission could be right here. Let me tell you something. Our food pantry and those people, those blessed hearts that work in that food pantry, there's a special place for you in heaven. That is a mission. Those are people that got up and said, you know what, I am going to listen. I've got a clear vision from God. I am going to go and work in that food pantry. They listened to God. They heard his calling, and God had blessed that calling. You don't need to necessarily be in Africa. You don't need to necessarily be in South America, but maybe it could be. It could be right here. It could be in the 12-step program that we have. It could be wherever God has you. But you need to rise above. You need to get away from the distraction. You need to not listen to anyone else. You need to not listen to this person, that person. You need to not look at this bill. You need not look at that career. Not look at that retirement. Not look at that goal. Let your goals be decided for you. Don't set your goals. If you have a goal in life, let it be to allow God to decide your goals more each and every day. Your goals are already scripted out for you. Right here. How many of you in this room have taken your goals out of this book right here? Or how many of you have listened to the world and had your goals figured out for you already? Well, this is my plan. God's like, okay, I'll wait. I'm going to keep walking though. If you want to know your future. You just listen to me. 
I'll tell you where to go. He is calling you. Climb your sycamore tree. Maybe it is a foreign mission that you've been called to. Maybe it's local. It's all great. God's banging on someone right now. In this room, God is knocking on someone's heart. God's been knocking on someone's heart. But you're fighting it. You're not there. You're, 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 you're sitting there going, Oh, God. Oh, my goodness. He's not talking to me, is he? Yeah. I am. It took someone just the same way while I'm sitting in one of those seats to say to me, Mike, God's knocking on your heart. God is telling you to do something. You need to obey. Yeah, but all these things that are going to happen, all these, stop. Obey. Don't worry. God's going to bless you. God's going to bring you a place where you're going to be going, wow, this is awesome. So much bigger than I ever thought. He did it for our family. As James comes up here right now, and I just want to, I want to urge you guys, don't wait. He's not calling you for tomorrow. He's calling you for today. If that is you, that God's been hammering on to start a ministry, to go into missions, to just be available for whatever he has for you. Bring it up to the altar today. Come on up here. He wants you, and he wants you now, not tomorrow. You know, maybe you're sitting there, and you just... Mike, you don't realize all the people I got sitting in front of me. You don't realize all the distractions. You don't realize the obstacles. I'm in this relationship, Mike, that I can't get out of. Is it bigger than God? Are you making that problem bigger than God? It's not. God's here for you. Maybe you don't have a relationship with him yet. Oh. He's here for you. He is just, he is sitting there. I mean, you've got to picture this father who sees his child there that, that he has never been able to sit there and talk to and, and play with. And, but he knows, and he's like, oh, please, please see me, see me. Today, for the first time, will you go up here? We have people that are up here that will show you in the Bible, how he just is dying to have a relationship with you. He just wants to be with you. He wants to play with you. And then, he's got a plan for you. Not to fail, but to succeed. He's going to provide for you over and beyond anything you could have ever dreamed of. He's got this life for you that is so exciting and so fun. Are you excited? Are you having fun? Let me tell you something. Life in Christ is exciting. And the more you depend on him, the faster this roller coaster goes. And let me tell you something, even if you're scared of roller coasters, it's the coolest thing in the world. Don't miss out on it. Don't miss out on it. Come on up here, man. Start that relationship with God today. Come closer. Be with him. Be with him.